They've been watching For me, I really wanted that to be the first piece of music on the album, just to set the tone, because I want this album to be a story and to really invite people in. So Sailor is, it wasn't intentional, but it really is a story of like rebirth and stepping into either the next chapter of your life or, you know, the next adventure or whatever. It just, it felt like this kind of new beginning in my life and Sailor just felt like the perfect opening just to kind of signal to people this is what this album really is about. You know, it was about a brand new stage in my life that had its ups and downs, but I hope by the end of it people consider it, a, you know, a celebration or a story of survival or of just becoming stronger. But um, Sailor, yeah, it's, I mean, when I was, when I was writing it, it did make me think of how traumatic birth is you know like for for the child for the mother but it's but you have to go through it to become what you're supposed to be every moon and every star knows who you are you know um well i wrote breathing underwater with chris loco he's a producer that i've worked a lot with we did um, a song called easier in bed for the deluxe version of our version of events and He's just an incredible producer, an incredible friend. He's someone I can really get very deep with in conversation and someone that I trust enough to go that deep with. So Breathing Underwater, I think we're supposed to be finishing another song for the album and we, but we just enjoy starting new songs. So we went in and then we were just speak, we, I think we were catching up. So we ended up talking for like five hours, just about everything, every, you know, we were just all different things he'd seen, different things I'd seen traveling around and what that meant at this stage in our lives, especially when you're growing with someone, there is a lot to talk about. So uh, we were talking for so long and then, okay, let's give it a go. And then he started playing the chords and it was literally like, I'm speaking to you now, those lyrics just start coming out. And I feel like <clears throat> I was at a point in my life where I felt like I had got through the storm. I had really become stronger and more confident in my place in the world. and you know, which path I wanted to walk on. So I feel like Breathing Underwater really summed up a real like celebration in my life and a real feeling of things that I thought were almost impossible. Wow, I'm actually like finding my stride again and, and getting on with life. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad it made you feel like that because Breathing Underwater, for me, at one point I did want it to come at the end of the album because I felt like it was finally, you know, say let it begin and Breathing Underwater there, but I wanted it to come second just to kind of almost show the ending at the beginning. Like this is, um, this is where I got to and this is, you know, this is what this whole journey was for. Even when I sing it now, it just means so much to me and it, it lifts me when I sing it, so I hope it does for other people. As soon as I start overthinking it or trying to write something specific, it almost becomes too thinky. Like you can hear that like you tried to be smart with that metaphor, blah, blah, blah. So for me, this song, it really just kind of came. I think like the melody came and then I said, oh, I'm, I'm breathing underwater. And then we did a next session, maybe like a few weeks later to finish the verses off. But um, if you hear the demo, the first time like it was kind of freestyling it, the chorus is there and then it was just trying to match that chorus with the verse. And that's when the pressure comes because you like, sometimes songs get left for like a year or two before I feel like brave enough to like tackle the verse. But this one, luckily, we just kind of did the same thing, chilled, talked, and then it, it came out. This track, I did want to capture the intimacy. Well, I wrote this song with um, a musician called Philip Lee, and we met through Naughty Boy, and this was the first song we'd ever written. We literally met that day and said, let's write a song, and then Happen came out. So um, it's got a really special memory for me in that because Phil was someone that I wrote a lot of the album with. So um, yeah, Happen, we had the chorus, and then Johnny Coffer did like these strings and just made it this grand, 
length thing, but it always it always started so intimate. So yeah, bringing it back down to that at the end for me was important because it is it's a prayer, it's a thought to yourself that you know whatever you have faith in, whether it seems completely against the odds, that it might just happen, and just having that kind of blind faith where where it has no logical meaning at all, it makes no sense. It was important that that was a personal thought, that bringing it back to almost a whisper. And I liked, I wanted it to kind of end on that cliffhanger, like, it might just, mm. but <laughs> have it. Um, but yeah, that's that's one of my favorite songs from the album. Hold tight, it's a sing along. I'm all right, I'm all right, but I could be wrong, baby. I know you remember me. By three in the back of the library, come on. You can at least try to look at me. I'm in, I'm in. Just generally with this album, I did want to kind of dig deeper in myself and show myself in a lot more of an honest light and not kind of gloss over too many things. I wanted to really dig in lyrically and musically into all different kinds of emotions and Hurts for me represents kind of accepting and learning how to express other emotions other than being in love or being sad. This was like, it was a frustration and it's a build up of um, feeling and things that aren't said and you know, every song really kind of represents a point in my life and Hurts came towards the end of, you know, making the album and I, I think it was a real time where I was willing to accept different types of emotion like anger or frustration and and find a way to kind of put that out through my music. So um, Hurts, yeah, it was something that I didn't really think about, I didn't really censor myself in this. It was with Phil and Matt Holmes and the, the original chorus came from a bass line he Phil's playing bass and I was like, baby, I'm on the edge of my hurts. And we kind of kept going around that. And then the verses started coming. And yeah, it really is just an explosion and just kind of um, me being a bit gangster. Yeah, it was. <laughs> there was even a few swear words in it. I was yeah. like, oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. It kind of felt for me like breaking out of a box. Yeah. You know, I think there's, there's certain things that people might expect from me. And I want to always give the same quality lyrically and musically. But I... I definitely challenged myself on this album to express every part of me, not just certain things that I thought people might expect or, or necessarily want to hear, but just every different part of me as a human being. And as I grew as a woman, I started to understand those sides of me more, so Hertz was definitely a reflection of that kind of learning process. So give me something. Give me something. Another one of my favourites. Um, we went up to a farm studio in, it's called Angelic Studios in Oxfordshire. So it was me, Phil Lee, Matt Holmes, and Chris Loco came um, to do some production as well. So Give Me Something just came from this big like piano jam. It's such an incredible studio. So we had every toy you could imagine, like any shaker, synth, piano, organ, like every, it was just like kind of our playground. So Give Me Something came at the end of, I think we're finishing a different song. And I think that was a real breakthrough for us in that we kind of stacked it with production and they were like, wait, we're doing too much. So we started pulling everything back. And the initial, like the original vocal and guitar just worked so well. And, you know, I feel really lucky to work with Phil because he's, he plays the guitar in a different way. It's not just for accompanying. He really has like such a musical sensibility and he does these riffs that just inspire lyrics or inspire feelings in me so it's so quick and easy to write songs with him so Give Me Something was just um, was the kind of point where we started pulling everything back and stripping things back and just saying if it's not needed let's leave it out so you have things like Hurts where we just felt it was we needed to put horns and strings in the gospel choir it felt like a song where we had to be very confident and very bold whereas um, Give me something. The sentiment and the storytelling of the song was the main focus. I mean, you kind of just left it. Oh, sorry, can I say one more? Yes. Yeah. Um, but lyrically, give me something. For me, it's like an explanation of the whole journey. Like, the whole thing was like, I just want something to believe in. And I think that's kind of a journey that everybody's on. And, you know, especially now when we live in a very digital world and it's hard, things aren't really tangible anymore. So, it was kind of just this cry for something to believe in and something, you know, like humanity and, and like real substance and um, and the things the things that I felt I did and that others might do to feel something. It might not be the right way, there's not much guidance on where to go, but it's, you know, I wanted to just kind of sing about that. I'm 
the songs the reason why I kind of put myself out there and, and tried to be as vulnerable and on, as honest as possible was that so people could have that connection and hopefully f feel that they can be just as vulnerable because it's important to get these feelings out and just to feel them but um yeah right now was I feel like it's a balance of trying to it's, it's like desperation but mixed with frustration mixed with like like enough is enough almost so um Right now is probably one of the most rawest moments and just, you know, all that is is the time vocal. But again, it was just trying to, to just to capture that emotion of, it was like anger and kind of frustration at how, you know, love and, yeah, love, it doesn't make sense and it can be unfair. And it was trying to put that in a song and capture that feeling. But when I listen to it now, I feel like, yeah, that's how I felt and yeah. I find it a lot easier to put emotion through music or through song, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you've dealt with anything. It just means that you've made a nice song out of it. So it's it was kind of getting that balance right of this personal growth I was going through, but also kind of trying to find the best way to put it through music, but allowing that growth. You know, I think that's why it took, you know, a couple of years to write this album because it was a growth and journey I was going on myself and being able to feel ready and secure to share that with the world was is another story. So, um, but yeah, it was very th therapeutic. Each song, I feel like I just gained a deeper understanding of myself. Even listening to it like months later, I was like, oh, right, yeah, it was in the song. Like, <laughs> it's, all, it's all there. Oh, my soul shakes. Shakes was one of the first songs written for the album and I wrote this song with uh, Naughty Boy and I think I'd just gotten back from a holiday or something and um, I had this voice note on my phone and it was like, it was the chorus for Shakes. So then, you know, that's why Naughty Boy's style is really great and very unique because he'll, he'll hear things that uh, others don't hear or I would have just added it to the rest of my voice notes it would never been he's like no that one you need to like you need to sit in there and do it and then we got this like killer one take vocal and it just all kind of came together very naturally and again with trust you need to find like a producer or musicians that you fully a thousand percent trust to kind of go to those depths with but um shakes for me was like you know, some people listen to it and think of it like a sad song, but for me I find it very empowering because that's how I love and it's how, whether it be a person or something I enjoy, sometimes it can get pretty intense, but Shakes for me was, it gave me understanding of the depths to which I would love someone or submission to somebody out of love and a devotion to somebody. But baby, when you're gentle, that's all that it takes. And my heart breaks, my soul shakes. And I just wanted to kind of really talk about love on a very real level because often it's spoken about on, you know, kind of superficial and it's sexy and it's cool and it's fun and like all of those things are great. But there is, maybe I'm just a kind of hopeless romantic, but there is love. There's love that's changed the world and there's partnerships that have changed the world and that depth of connection is something that I really wanted to capture and I wanted to talk about that connection on a very real and raw level. So Shakes for me is kind of talking about, you know, the true depths of love and when I look at my mum and dad for example, they've been through like the craziest things in their life, they've dealt with racism, they've dealt with abuse, like no money, struggling, these kids, like, and for me that's an example of true love and a love that shakes the soul or breaks a heart, you know, so that's what I really want to try and get with that and when I listen to it I'm, I'm really happy that I've kind of managed to sum it up in my eyes. You make it real, make me feel, make me feel I'm the strongest steel, and as tall as the mountains, talk as cheap Garden, where would you say it started? It was a freedom of exploring different, a different genre, different production um, And the song started with, um, well, every piece came together so naturally And it really captured, like, life And I feel like whatever, like 
art form you want to go through when you can really capture life as it's happening and completely naturally um it's just such a beautiful thing and I, i'm so happy we managed to do it at the garden but um chris loco produced the track we were in london and maybe two weeks prior to that anya and i were in new york and she recorded some poetry so when i came back we wrote the song garden and then I was like, I've got something that sounds perfect with that. So we put um, the poetry at the beginning. And then maybe, what, six, seven months after that, we met um, Jay Electronica. I met Jay Electronica through Naughty Boy. Actually, I was with Anya as well. We weren't supposed to really make, there was no plans to kind of get in the studio and make music. I played Garden, he really liked it. Then we were all hanging out and um, we were with this guy called Keys, Kieran. He was playing it on the piano and then Jay started writing his verse on that. So it was all just like, no label was involved, nobody was putting this together. It was all just us kind of going with the wind and really just feeling free and responding to, to what felt right artistically. So yeah, that's Garden and I love it. And it really just sums up that summer of kind of freedom and just being able to be 100% artistic. There was nothing kind of holding, some, holding us back from not being creative. And um, I'm just really happy we managed to get on the album. And uh, I just think it works. It really tells like after shakes, kind of that like depth of emotion just to kind of fully let go and be free. That was the next part of the story after shakes. No, I can't make it stop. It's funny because it really seems to be a track that like men like. Like it's, it seems really relatable um, in that sense. But I'd rather not was is a song I did with Naughty Boy Shaka Valley, who's a, a great producer um, that we always hang out with at the studio. He's like Naughty Boy's best friend, so. We've always made music together, so to, to get a track on the album um, with Shaq was amazing. And Johnny Coffer as well worked on this one. And I'd rather not. Yeah, it's just kind of like, yeah, I do love being in love and I love being in relationships and all of those type of things. And But sometimes that can work against you, you know, because you kind of ignore all the pain that comes with that. So I'd rather not really was a turning point. And it's a part in the story, like after shakes, after guard, and then I'd rather not is when I, you really start developing a sense of self-worth and self-respect. And it's great to feel, um, to feel one with somebody, but um, it's better to feel whole yourself first. And so to kind of go through these lyrics of how you're feeling and then be like, as much as I'd love to, because I would still love to. It's not a case of like, you can't just like scrap something and throw it away. As much as I'd love to, I'd rather not. So it's kind of admitting that split thing in your head of, I would really love to, like you make my brain feel amazing and all these like crazy chemicals, but then it's kind of finding discipline within yourself to be like, it's too much pain to be worth it. So yeah, that's I'd rather not. Sometimes I get alone Sometimes you can be tough with production and you can be hard hitting, but I just love words. Like, I love how words can be a little bit gangster, but slyly. Like, only if you really listen would you kind of hear certain things. And I wanted to make sure that every song had that energy, like that confidence and kind of directness about it. So Lonely, yeah, it was kind of summing something that's very complicated up. and not having a specific reason to be like to be like baby i'm out here but it's a very important reason if you know what i mean so i felt happy that i kind of managed to put it in words um but yeah some days you don't know me that's a problem <laughs> you know that's a big problem so yeah i'm glad you picked up on that and yeah. i just like that one i was still here and was still breathing knee deep with the deep needing we stay brave though Sweet Architect, I think, is probably one of the, the realest tracks on the album because it's not really speaking about my personal experiences in a relationship or it's not speaking about a relationship at all. It's just kind of how I view the world at the moment and hopefully like a prayer that many people can sing or say regardless of religion or beliefs. Just something that sums up the times we're in, you know, and I just feel like this song coming out now 
I just feel it's a bit, the world's a bit of a mess at the moment but kind of progressively just getting heavier and darker. Um, Sweet Architect, I just hope that will be an important song and I can't wait to perform it live. So baby, reach out and remind me that it's real. I need you to love me tenderly. Oh, I need you to touch me gently. Yeah, tenderly I feel is kind of like the turning point in the album because Sweet Architect is a real, you know, it's a cry for help and it's, it's a very um, emotional prayer and then after that you know after I think you have a prayer with such depth it's kind of it's cleansing and Tenderly is yeah it's a song that um, my dad's featured Joel Sande and my cousins in Zambia they're, they're singing a song that well, I went to, vi to visit Zambia a few years ago and everyone could sing everyone was making music and it was just kind of in the blood and it really made me understand my my love for music and why I love singing so much and we, we, we made lots of recordings and because it was such a kind of a pivotal point in my life I wanted it to be part of the story of the album so um, yeah so that recording in there was actually done in the village um, and tenderly for me it just has the right sentiment it's like you can't sometimes you can't change the world and People are going to be how they are, but the people that you keep closest to you, just make sure they're on your side and that, you know, they treat you with tenderness and, you know, love. <laughs> Every single little piece, I wrote that with Phil, Phil Lee, and um, yeah, it, for me it's like a real traditional song and as much as I love to experiment with different genres, I always love soul music. You know, I grew up with Mariah Carey, Whitney Houston, Eternal. Like, I just loved those songs where you get these big voices, but just with this, like, I just love it. And I, I don't think I could ever let go of that, that love, so every single little piece for me it's like, yeah, things are looking good, things are looking nice, you're ready to kind of make that leap again, jump in. Yeah, I just, I mean, that's what that one's about. I see you laughing, but you know what I mean. I'm talking about the highs. I'm talking about the lows. Um, highs and lows, I wrote this with uh, TMS and Wayne Hector. For me, it just feels like a a moment of freedom in the album because it's quite serious and I really wanted to get to the bottom of quite a lot of complicated feelings and emotions so Highs and Lows was really just letting go of that and just making music for people to have fun with and for people to feel good with um, and we've been performing this one live recently and it just it feels nice you know and um, I like that kind of just let your hair down and enjoy, enjoy so baby, it's okay, it's okay now Let it out, let it love, let it rain down That was one of the last songs written for the album and definitely one of my favourites, especially after performing it live. It just, it gets people involved pretty instantly. And uh, I wanted to put this one at the end because it felt like, you know, you're through it now. Like whatever comes after this is you as a kind of happy, confident person and you know, trusting love again and and really embracing it. That's what Babe is for me and kind of just accepting it back into your life and accepting that that's something that you need in your life. Um, that's kind of what Babe's about, but kind of similar to highs and lows. It's, I just want people to feel good and I do like to squeeze in a bit of singing rap in that again. I'm slowly <laughs> getting to my rap career, <laughs> step by step. But um, yeah, Babe's one of my favorites. And I just thought, when I listened to it, it just feels like the perfect end to the album. Like, okay, it was tough and it was bumpy, but we got there in the end. For me, I just feel like, you know, this whole journey I've been on, personally and through making the album, um, I just learned a lot about myself and a lot about the world. I feel like, it's, it's not enough to kind of passively want good things to happen. It's not enough to kind of, you know, wish for things. I really learned that you have to be definite and you have to choose your side and you have to like put your energy and your time behind things that you want to happen. Because if we all sit back and watch them, you know, anything could happen to the world and, and we'd all be to blame really. So Long Live the Angels was, I want to encourage people to kind of 
accept their emotions and allow themselves to be vulnerable at some point and to tell the truth, you know, this is how you feel, this is how you feel, like, let's work through it and to, to believe in a, like, happy ending or to believe in that you can get through these things. So Long of the Angels for me is, I want to encourage as many people as possible, but that's the side I've chosen and that's, that's what I support and want to continue to support beyond anything else, you know. Good things, good people, and that's the truth. Good vibes, good energy. <laughs> Thank you. That's what Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Got me thinking. <laughs>